Tena koto te fano o Auckland Unitarians. Tena koto na manahiri. No by, higher by. Higher by ki tene fare karakia a te atua. Tena koto tena tato katoa. We welcome you into this circle of community. Welcome into the space made sacred by Auckland Unitarians for 115 years. We especially welcome you if you are a visitor just passing through or seeking a spiritual home. We also welcome you to join us for a cuppa at morning tea. It is our sacrament of hospitality and it won't be complete without you. This morning, we immerse ourselves in compassion for too often we stand divided to set apart from one another in heedless ways. We seek to be compassionate, but our vision may be clouded or distracted. Too often we go forward day by day and look without seeing. May we work to heal the divisions which separate Earth's children one from another. May we peer through the mists of deception which hide and deny violence, myths enclosing those who suffer. May we not allow the misuse of our fellow souls to hide in broad daylight. When we see the afflicted, however, they may be afflicted, may we not shrink away. May we not blame suffering on the one who suffers. May we be courageous enough to perceive suffering and compassionate enough to attend to the voices of those who suffer. When we see prejudice, when we hear evil speaking, when we witness the rough hand or the scathing word laid upon the helpless or innocent, may we resolve to work toward unity and justice. May we not turn away from the wounded head of the abused. May we not accept the twisted reasoning by which the oppressor declares himself the victim. Let our gratitude for good fortune in our lives lead us not to complacency, but to awareness. Awareness of those whose lives are shadowed by abuse or neglect. May we not ignore signs of deceit or denial that hide brutality. In all things, may those who suffer ever be able to approach us, find a kindly ear and sporting hand. May we witness for love and justice at every level of relationship. May we nurture a keen eye and a strong and loving heart for any who fear the hurtful rod the cutting voice, the uneven hand, the chain of oppression, great or small. Karen Armstrong, author of 12 Steps to Living a Compassionate Life, founded a global movement, the Charter for Compassion, intent on creating compassionate cities she says, a compassionate city is an uncomfortable city, a city that is uncomfortable when anyone is homeless or hungry, uncomfortable if every child isn't loved and given rich opportunities to grow and thrive, uncomfortable when as a community we don't treat our neighbors as we would wish to be treated. The charter that cities sign up for reads, the principle of compassion lies at the heart of all religious, ethical, and spiritual traditions, calling us always to treat all others as we wish to be treated ourselves. Compassion impels us to work tirelessly to alleviate the suffering of our fellow creatures, to dethrone ourselves from the center of our world and put another there and to honor the inviolable sanctity of every single human being, 
treating everybody without exception with absolute justice, equity, and respect. It is also necessary in both public and private life to refrain consistently and empathetically from inflicting pain, to act or speak violently out of spite, chauvinism, or self-interest, to impoverish, exploit, or deny basic rights to anybody, and to incite hatred by denigrating others, even our enemies, is a denial of our common humanity. We acknowledge that we have failed to live compassionately and that some have even increased the sum of human misery in the name of religion. We therefore call upon all men and women to restore compassion to the center of morality and religion, to return to the ancient principle that any interpretation of scripture that breeds violence, hatred, or disdain is illegitimate. To ensure that youth are given accurate and respectful information about other traditions, religions, and cultures. To encourage a positive appreciation of cultural and religious diversity. To cultivate an informed empathy with the suffering of all human beings, even those regarded as enemies. We urgently need to make compassion a clear, luminous, and dynamic force in our polarized world, rooted in a principled determination to transcend selfishness. Compassion can break down political, dogmatic, ideological, and religious boundaries. Born of our deep interdependence, compassion is essential to human relationships and to a fulfilled humanity. It is the path to enlightenment and indispensable to the creation of a just economy and a peaceful global community. We join our voices in a holy communion of mind and heart, dedicated to the promises that bind us in compassion, one with another. In this hour, we light the flame that signals our intention to find the sacred in every living thing. I had the uh, challenge of writing this sermon prior to knowing yesterday's election results. All I know is that those results will be very much on our minds this morning. It has been a roller coaster campaign with leadership changes in three of the parties. Poll results shifted almost daily, sometimes dramatically, leaving confusion in their wake. There were the usual outbreaks of dirty politics and debates about what influence they would have on the final outcome. There were the debates about the debates and who won. But once the dust, or stardust, if you will, settles, I believe historians will see this as the compassion election. After nine years of policies that resulted in increasing income and wealth inequality to record levels, an inexcusable rise in homelessness and children living in poverty, a critically underfunded healthcare system, greater damage to our environment, a housing crisis that froze the younger generation out of home ownership, and a huge rise in student debt that will be a ball and chain around the next generation's aspirations for decades to come. Suddenly, all the major parties expressed concern about the vulnerable in our society, even the incumbents. As an electorate, we were challenged to vote for the best interests of others for a change, rather than our own. The Facebook meme, or meme, I'm never quite sure how to say that, paid taxes is love, describes the shift. 
No matter what the results of the election were yesterday, it is this change of heart that gives me faith in our future as a country. If it resulted in a change of government, that faith is magnified greatly. If it didn't, I can take comfort that the present government has been pushed by the voters to be more compassionate, be it ever so reluctantly. In the aftermath of this election, what intrigues me as both a theologian and a political junkie is how we as a people can have closed our hearts to those not blessed by our privilege for the past nine years and now be opening the door of our hearts to show them compassion. How can we as a people have both hardened and softened hearts? Buddhist teacher Thich Nhat Hanh seems to share my intrigue in this paradox. He explores it in his poem, Call Me By My True Names. Do not say that I'll depart tomorrow because even today I still arrive. Look deeply. I arrive in every second to be a bud on a spring branch, to be a tiny bird with wings still fragile, learning to sing in my new nest, to be a caterpillar in the heart of a flower, to be a jewel hiding itself in a stone. I still arrive in order to laugh and to cry, in order to fear and to hope. The rhythm of my heart is the birth and death of all that are alive. I am the mayfly metamorphosing at the surface of the water, river. And I am the bird which, when spring comes, arrives in time to eat the mayfly. I am the frog swimming happily in the clear pond. And I am also the grass snake who, approaching in silence, feeds itself on the frog. I am the child in Uganda, all skin and bones, my legs as thin as bamboo sticks. And I am the arms merchant selling deadly weapons to Uganda. I am the young girl refugee on a small boat who throws herself into the ocean after being violated by a sea pirate. And I am the pirate, my heart not yet capable of seeing and loving. I'm a member of the Politburo with plenty of power in my hands. And I am the man who has to pay his debt of blood to my people dying slowly in a forced labor camp. My joy is like spring, so warm it makes flowers bloom in all walks of life. My pain is like a river of tears, so full it fills the four oceans. Please call me by my true names so I could hear all my cries and laugh at once, so I could see that my joy and pain are one. Please call me by my true names so I can wake up and so the door of my heart can be left open, the door of compassion. In it, in this poem, Thich Nhat Hanh suggests that the way to open the door is to actually share a name with the beautiful and the ugly, the violent and the tender. It is a challenging poem, and it seems to raise the question, is it possible or indeed realistic or advisable to open our hearts that wide? Apparently, it is. There is a village where there's been no crime, not even petty theft, for more than 400 years. This village is located in a region of India that has one of the highest crime rates in the country. And yet, in Shani Shingnapur, the home of about 3,000 people, 
There are no disputes between neighbors, no murders or crimes whatsoever. When, shop when shopkeepers go on vacation, they simply put a wooden plank across the door, confident that nothing will be stolen. What could account for this phenomenon? The people of the village worship a Hindu god, Lord Shani. They have great faith that Shani will protect them. That faith is one thing that sets the village apart. But there's something else, too. None of the buildings has doors, locks, or keys. As one resident describes it, everybody lives together here with our hearts connected. We would all like to live in a place that embodies the interdependent web of all existence, but our reptile brain tells us that is neither practical nor realistic to leave our doors unlocked. Yet a deeper part of ourselves, which neuroscientists tell us resides in our more highly evolved frontal cortex, wants us to leave the door to our heart open no matter what. Ruby, the 12th century Sufi poet, captures both our yearning and our fear. This being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness, some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all. Even if they are a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice. Meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whatever comes, because each has been sent. Well, that said, from a practical standpoint, who wouldn't want to bar the door? We tend not to welcome the shadow sides of ourself. The aspects of ourselves and others that do not conform to our hopes and dreams, that make terrible mistakes, that fail, that led others down. Yet the poet calls us to attend to them. Don't lock and bar the door, for they could be a guide from beyond. I envision that guide to be the compassionate person we seek to become. Denying that we have a dark side will not open the door. We must call our shadow sides by their true names if we are also to discover our capacity to love ourselves. The first requirement if we are ever to show compassion to our neighbors. Karen Armstrong, who I spoke of earlier, uh, shared a story in an address to Unitarian Universalists a few years ago about the late rabbi Albert Friedlander. He had grown up in Nazi Germany and as a child was bewildered and distressed by the vicious anti-Semitic propaganda that assailed him on all sides. One night when he was about eight years old, he deliberately lay awake and made a list of all of his good qualities. He told himself firmly that he was not what the Nazis said, that he had talents and, a special, and special gifts of heart and mind, which he enumerated to himself one by one. Finally, he vowed that if he survived, he would use those qualities to build a better world. This was an extraordinary insight for a child in such circumstances. Albert was one of the, the kindest people she says she had ever met. He was almost pathologically gentle 
and must have brought help and counsel to thousands. But he always said that he could, not, he could have done no good at all unless he had learned at that terrible moment of history to love himself. The Buddhist teacher, Jack Cornfield, tells a very powerful story about compassion. It is the kind of wisdom story that may be hard to take in because it may challenge our assumptions about the human capacity for forgiveness and love. He writes this from his own experience. Cornfield writes, once on a train from Washington, D.C. to Philadelphia, I found myself seated next to a man who had run a rehabilitation program for juvenile offenders in Washington, D.C. Most of the youths he worked with were gang members who had committed homicide. One 14-year-old boy in the program had shot and killed an innocent teenager to prove himself to his gang. At the trial, the victim's mother sat impassively silent until the end. When the youth was convicted of the killing, after the verdict was announced, she stood up slowly and stared directly at the young man and said, I'm going to kill you. The youth was then taken away. After six months had gone by, the woman went to visit her son's killer. He had been living on the streets before committing the crime, and she was the only visitor he'd had. For a time, they talked, and when she left, she gave him some money for cigarettes. Then she started step by step to visit him more regularly, bringing food and small gifts. Near the end of his three-year sentence, she asked him what he would be doing when he got out. He was confused and uncertain, so she offered to set him up with a job at a friend's company. Then she inquired about where he would live. And since he had no family to return to, she offered him temporary use of the spare room in her home. For eight months, he lived there, ate her food, and worked at the job. Then one evening, she called him into the living room to talk. She sat down opposite him and waited. Then she said, do you remember in the courtroom when I said I was going to kill you? I sure do, he replied. Well, I did. She went on. I did not want the boy who could kill my son for no reason to remain alive on this earth. I wanted him to die. That's why I started to visit you and bring you things. That's why I got you the job and let you live here in my house. That's how I set about changing you. And that old boy, he's gone. So now I want to ask you, since my son is gone and the killer is gone, if you'll stay here. Cornfield concludes that any heart could open that widely and in that way and through such tragedy is hard for me and perhaps many of us to imagine. It may seem indeed beyond us. And yet, as the wisdom teachers tell us, that mother is also of us. She too is one of our true names. Compassion is not a pleasant sensation that originates and remains with the person doing the feeling. It's an active and intimate connecting with others, a sharing of mutual vulnerability, only letting life in, including the aspects of life that are difficult or strange. Can we access 
to the deep self that transcends our individuality. In the language of spiritual wisdom, the heart is more than a part of the body. It connects us with the entire body of life. So be it. Well, I've debated whether or not to do a meditation. And I thought, perhaps we need to discuss it yesterday and what's going on with us and to give you an opportunity to respond to what I had to say. After living through the 1984 election in New Zealand, which was an earthquake, that sent us down this path to greater inequality, which I celebrated the victory of the Labour Party at the time. I'm always sceptical, and I never, I never support any party or get emotionally supportive because 1984 was a tremendous lesson to uh, those of us who lived through it. Changed New Zealand forever and for the worse. And we've gone down that path, whether it's been Labour in government or national government ever since. If we turn around, that's wonderful, but I'm not counting on that. Um, I think what your, the, the, your daughter said is basically exactly how I feel, um, but also still hopeful because from, I guess, the reports, the, a lot of people ended up... Um, putting in special votes because they were out of electorates, especially those that were all at university. Most of them are all special votes that won't get counted for the, until the next two... Like, we won't know until the next two weeks. So there's that. And I guess um, the other thing is, yay, because we have one of the youngest MPs now in Parliament for, like, 42 years. So I guess there's a bit of... Silver lining in, in the election outcome for, for most, some of us. <laughs> Actually, I, I was um, very interested about the topic of the sermon, compassion, and it made me think that, am I compassionate? And I then thought about empathy and I, the difference between empathy and compassion. And I think I'm an empathetic person. I find that I empathise with people easily. But compassion, compassion is very confronting because I think compassion means you're actually doing something and you're, and I have tried by doing things like um, volunteering with refugees with English and it is very confronting because you are often dealing with people that are so completely different and it really is difficult sometimes to be compassionate. Easy to be empathetic, but compassion, hmm. My, my thoughts when uh, when you were talking about compa when you were talking about compassion, uh, my thoughts were that we sometimes forget about self compassion. We, we see it as something that's always uh, given to others. But I, I think that in, in New Zealand, a lot of people in the uh, low low socioeconomic uh, situation they they have internalized this uh, hatred that's. Uh, that they experience in the public discourse and, and uh, this lack of self-compassion is what uh, is a hindrance uh, to taking action and, and to, uh, to making an attempt uh, to changing their situation. So I, I think we also need to teach people self-compassion and not see it as something that's given from someone in a better situation to someone in a worse situation because that's like another kind of hierarchical relationship. Um, I just want to talk about MMP and proportional representation. And I think there's huge possibilities in proportional representation away from a winner takes all. And I think both national and labor are driving a narrative that it's still a really binary situation that we're in. And as long as we accept that, um, there are fewer and fewer possibilities. And as long as we accept that, that the person with the most votes 
gets to govern um, rather than, we, the, than allowing the possibility that um, we could have a coalition of different voices and different um, views, then um, we're letting them and we're letting that winner-takes-all um, narrative win and we don't have to. For my closing words, to wish for compassion, to pray for courage, to experience doubt, to bear sorrow, to strive for sureness. All these are qualities for which each of us should be grateful. But to feel a genuine fellowship for the whole human family, to act so that our empathy is evident wherever we go, that's the object. That's the lifelong goal.